welcome to the very first event of the new sustainability track of the MIT Club of Northern California. I'm Jean Lee, and I'll be your uh, MC for this evening. And we're, if you're interested in volunteering or working with the track, please feel free to contact me, or you can contact Bill as well. Um, but for this evening, for our very first event, I'm, I'm really delighted and honored that uh, Professor Richard Luthi has, has agreed to give us a talk on um, urban water challenges. So Professor Luthi is the Silas Palmer Professor of um, Civil Environmental Engineering at Stanford University, and he's also a senior fellow uh, with the Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford. He's also a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and a, he's a registered professional engineer. <laughs> uh, some of the things he formerly did was that he was formerly chair of the department, and uh, he's the former chair of the National Research Council's uh, Water Science and Technology Board. And I'm, I'm only giving you just the merest small fraction of all of his accomplishments and honors. Um, so Professor Luthi's interests are in um, engineering uh, physical chemical processes for, for water quality. And so we're really delighted to have him here to talk tonight on um, uh, securing more sustainable solutions to urban water challenges. So let's welcome Professor Luthi. Thank you so much. Well, Jean, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, so, um, Dick Luthi from Stanford University, uh, I've been to MIT, I don't have connections there, uh, I have three degrees from Berkeley, so uh, I'll, I'll just answer this question right straight out. Uh, what do I do during the big game? And, <laughs> and the answer is, is that I root for Stanford but pray for Cal. <laughs> All right, uh, with that I'd like to talk about um, water issues that we're facing. Uh, and um, this center that we have at Stanford uh, um, combines um, resources with uh, University of California, Berkeley, Colorado School of Mines, and New Mexico State. Uh, this center is uh, currently funded for five years from the National Science Foundation. We hope we'll get a five-year renewal. We'll be in business for a total of 10 years. The theme is uh, reinventing the nation's urban water infrastructure and uh, uh, so I have a sort of a motivational slide here about um, issues that affect the part of the country in which we live. Uh, there's, there's a picture of the U.S. drought monitor. Now, I didn't update this from uh, April, but uh, the, it really, the story really hasn't changed in the West. This is the driest year in recorded history for the state of California. Um, so we're in an area where um, things are dry, uh, and where population will increase. Um, climate change means that uh, there'll be more evapotranspiration. Um, there may be a little less runoff. Certainly will be a, a different form. We'll get more rain, less snow. Um, a story that's common throughout the United States, though, is that we're, in the, uh, we're at the end of our design life for our urban water infrastructure. Most of it was put in place for water uh, before World War II and for wastewater after World War II. So um, it's all somewhere between 50 and 100 years old. And so that means that uh, we have this big bill before us, uh, dollar bill, in terms of how do we deal with the um, decaying infrastructure. And this presents an opportunity for us uh, that we can do something new and different in the future. Or we might decide we'll just muddle along and do a patchwork of things like we've done before. The other reality that we have uh, here, and when I say here, we can just think of the Bay Area or California, is we're, we realize we, there will be less imported water. It's going to be less water to go around. And as I was telling um, some folks earlier before we started, historically, the situation in California was agriculture versus cities. Um, when I was um, graduate student at Berkeley in environmental engineering, the Clean Water Act had just passed. Uh, the Clean Water Act basically said you, you couldn't poison the fish. There wasn't anything in the act that said you couldn't take all their water. So that's nowadays we realize you can't take all their water. Um, so we have a new claimant uh, on our water supplies in California, and that's uh, environmental services, environmental systems. So we have uh, these, these challenges before us, and also we have an ever-expanding list of contaminants uh, that we have to pay attention to. And most of the new ones 
are not exo exotic industrial chemicals. There are things that you and I use in our daily lives. Basically, it's uh, personal care products and pharmaceuticals that are the sort of tough prop tough issues to deal with. So, this is um, these are all things that are happening now as as we sit here in this room. Um, I mentioned to a couple of folks earlier about uh, Monterey. And uh, Monterey, in some way, is, is just a microcosm of California in the sense that they're not tied to the state water project, um, and they're struggling with how to meet their own water supply needs. And so what happened in Monterey here, uh, whoops, I pushed the wrong button. Uh, what happened in Monterey is this is what the Carmel River looked like for about half the year. And here's the Carmel River Valley here, and California American Water would pump water from the edge of the river here over into Monterey, Pacific Grove, and Seaside, and basically supply the water for this whole community. But in the process of doing that, they would deplete the surface water from the Carmel River. Well, um, what's happened now is that um, the California American Water Company isn't allowed to do that anymore. Uh, they have to leave water in the, in the Carmel River, so it will look like this for much of the year. So this is an example of where um, extensive groundwater pumping resulted in this depletion of the surface flow of the water that then triggers certain acts in California that says you can't do that anymore. Now, what's the solution here? And we're, the answer is, is there isn't any one solution. And uh, what we'll be doing here is there'll be um, water reuse. And over in this area, there's um, uh, the, there's a Monterey Regional Water Quality Control Plant. They will upgrade that water to drinking water quality and put it in the aquifer here for later recovery. Uh, so there's that water reuse, there's aquifer storage, and there's a, it'll be a desal plant that'll put over along here that will provide water. So this is a, pl a place where um, they need to, f um, they have a, we speak in terms of acre feet as uh, in, in terms of our water supply, and they have a, a gap of about six or 7,000 acre feet a year. And it's through these strategies they hope to make up that uh, difference. So I just wanted to put that out there is that this is a little microcosm of California. Also, you have all these agricultural interests right there in Salinas, and you have uh, some of the most productive agricultural land in the whole world out here in this valley here. And much of that is um, irrigated now, 12,000 acres with recycled water. So um, a way to think about the future then is you know, a changing framework for doing things differently in the future. And what I was going to do tonight was just touch on each of these um, uh, four themes. Um, increasing water availability by new treatment options and by water recycle. And broadening our treatment options, thinking about natural systems as part of our treatments, uh, a suite of techniques we might use to help purify water. And considering wastewater as a resource and, um, and uh, not a problem. And also think about the political science issues that have to be addressed in affecting change in our field. And the latter there is really important. So I'm going to show you two pie charts tonight. Um, one is the water supply for Santa Clara County, where we are, and one later for Los Angeles. Um, but here's the um, water supply uh, pie chart for Santa Clara Valley Water District. And the interesting thing here is that it really is a pie chart. Now, whoops, I kind of learned to push the right button. Uh, Hetch Hetchy is imported water. Uh, Central Valley Project, uh, uh, that's imported water. State Water Project is, uh, is imported water. Um, these, these are not going to increase over time. Uh, what's, what Santa Clara Valley uh, Water District is looking to do is for one, expand recycling uh, by more than two and a half times, uh, well, within the next 12 years, so that this wedge here will become a whole lot bigger. So it's interesting to look at what Santa Clara Valley Water District does now, what we do right now in terms of water recycling. Um, this is what's set up, is that um, we have this uh, uh, large treatment plant that treats water from San Jose, Milpitas, and Santa Clara. It's located at the south end of the bay on the, on the, on the bay lens there. And if you fly in uh, from the east, uh, your planes make a, 
uh, be a right turn. Uh, if you look out the left side of the airplane, uh, you can see that, that treatment plan. It's very prominent. Um, so what what is done here is oops whoops I'm, I'm going to get this right. Um, what's done here is this water from the three cities is collected and goes through a series of treatment steps that produces a very high quality water that's safe for discharge to the bay. But it goes through a couple additional steps here um, of filtration and disinfection, and they produce a water now that can be recycled and can be used for landscaping and process water for businesses and that kind of thing. So this is the current situation, and when we recycle water like this, we put it into, di into distinctive colored pipes, uh, purple, they're purple pipes, and that's to indicate that this water is not intended for uh, uh, drinking water use, but it's fine for irrigation and that sort of things. So that's, that's the current situation. Um, but this situation, this, this isn't um, so perfect, um, but it does have a lot of advantages. Um, and this shows uh, the energy that's required uh, with the current supply of water and the energy that's required to produce that, that recycled water. And you don't need to pay attention to the units here, but I just wanted to call attention to the height of this bar. That's the current supply. And the height of this bar, which is the recycled water. And it's about half. And the reason it's about half is because you're not paying the energy to pump all that water in, into the valley. Um, now, there's still some um, conveyance issues here, and energy required for redistribution of that water, for sure. Um, but that's the current situation. And later, if you want to know about energy for desal, we can come back and, and look at that. Uh, so the energy and this idea of using recycled water um, not only saves water, but saves energy. Um, so, here's the problem we have right now, is that this treatment plant, which is located on the edge of the bay, has these big sewers that collect water from all over, and the sewers have been in the ground a long time. They're like um, a series of, uh, of connected pipes, uh, and you can imagine over time th these pipes would crack a little bit. So what happens as these sewers get near the bay, um, the water gets a little bit too salty um, because you get some infiltration into the sewers. The sewers are not pressurized, they're gravity fed. So that water that then comes uh, through this system is too salty for long-term sustainable irrigation for our native plants. So a solution to this then is to take the salts out. Well, taking the salts out is tough. So these are the steps that are done here to take the salts out. First, a microfiltration process, then a reverse osmosis, and then a UV disinfection, and then this water is blended at a ratio of uh, one to two uh, to give the right salt content, and then it goes back, back to the city. So to produce a water now that is uh, uh, suitable for long-term irrigation, we have um, invested in a 10 million gallon a day facility that now um, takes the salt out of the water. This water that's, pro this water that's uh, produced here is essentially drinking water quality. Um, we can come back and talk about that, but that's, uh, that's pure water. Um, and in the future, what our story will be with this system is very likely that we'll think of other things to do with this water, like use it to help augment our uh, local water supplies rather than blending it back in to um, uh, a system like, like this and using it for irrigation. We'll use it for a higher purpose. Um, so this is where we are today with that centralized treatment, centralized redistribution, and now this plant off to the side that's this desal plant. So what's wrong with all that? Well, to make this system work, to make this, to make this system work, you need, a, in this case, 130 miles of this purple pipe. Uh, and it's expensive to place this pipe in a city. Um, in urban areas, it averages out about $2 million a mile. So imagine now you want to more than double 
the amount of water that you're recycling. That's the goal for the Valley Water District. You say, oh my goodness, uh, this distribution system is really expensive to put in place. There's another problem here. All the sewers are gravity fed down to this plant. And so when you redistribute the water, you're pumping the water back uphill. So that takes a lot of energy. And I should add one more bullet here, and this whole water is too salty. So we need to do something new and different. And uh, what might that be? Well, as we look to the future, we would think, well, we should think more about distributed systems. And distributed systems would be um, imagining satellite plants uh, that could reclaim water and the resources that are in that water um, and do it in a place where that water is generated and needed. And so a schematic might look like this, where this is be this tree here represents sort of the, the sewage system. Here's the centralized plant. This could be the Palo Alto Regional Water Quality Control Plant. could be Sunnyvale or San Jose. Um, and you could imagine that you would have neighborhoods here where you could put in a recycling facility. And if we did this right, uh, there are ways in which we could use certain new technologies to recover the energy that's the chemical energy that's in the um, potential chemical energy that's in wastewater and use that to power the plant itself. So this is a, this is a new idea, a new way of thinking. Decentralized systems so that we can capture water where it's generated and needed and do it in ways that are energy positive rather than energy negative. Um, and so is, is where, where might we do this? Well, I have to say something about Stanford. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah, that's right, a golf course. So all right, I'll go off script for a second, all right? Um, the sort of joke in our field is if you want to know where the wastewater treatment plant was, just go find the local golf course. A and that's exactly what we do here in Palo Alto. Uh, you know, the municipal course, the other side of the bay is irrigated with recycled water. The problem is, is that water is sal salty too. And uh, if you have redwoods and trees like that, they, they won't survive. But Greer Park is, um, is uses recycled water, the municipal golf course, and that big purple pipe I showed takes water um, from Palo Alto to part of that uh, industrial district that's, uh, well, where Sun Microsystems used to be. Um, but um, that's all still centralized. So here's, here's the deal. Um, we're looking at um, how we could do this at Stanford uh, and building on the Stanford campus a um, water reclamation facility that would use new membrane technologies and new anaerobic processes to capture the organic matter in the wastewater as methane, burn the methane to generate electricity. The electricity would run the plant. You'd have a bit extra electricity you could put out on the grid. So this whole idea of energy positive treatment on a decentralized basis makes a lot of sense. You don't have to build a big purple pipe going up Embarcadero Avenue. Um, you don't have water that's too salty. We know our, our water is snow melt basically from Hetch Hetchy. So you're not, and also you don't, you're not pumping the water back uphill. So that's a vision for the future. Um, we also might imagine that uh, uh, we might produce waters of different qualities for different purposes. And there are a few places around the state where we can look for inspiration. Um, and one of them is down here at uh, West Basin, where West Basin produces, uh, this is a, uh, a district that's just south of the LA airport, and it, uh, it's all industrial. And they produce um, various kinds of water um, for uh, boiler makeup, for cooling tower makeup, for irrigation, and for um, uh, salt water intrusion barrier. So um, this is an example then of uh, thinking that, of rethinking the system too, where we don't necessarily have to produce one kind of water, but we could produce different quality waters depending on what the purpose would be. With our colleagues at Colorado School of Mines, we're investigating decentralized treatment. And um, in a dorm area that has about 750 beds, and uh, using a combination of different kinds of reactors that can work in sequence here to operate on a basis where 
you leave the nitrogen and phosphorus in the water, that's nutrients, or you take them out. So a little bit of, if you're not too familiar with water, um, generally when you think about um, water purity and the like, you're imagining uh, pathogens in water, and that's primary concern. All right. Other things about wastewater, though, um, beyond things that reduce uh, oxygen in water, the next biggest problems are, are nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. So you don't want your wastewater to artificially um, uh, fertilize streams and rivers. But if you're using that water for irrigation, it's good to leave that, those chemicals in the water because otherwise you buy fertilizer. So this system, and I won't go into the details, it, it can change from one season to the next to where it's nitrogen and phosphorus rich or nitrogen and phosphorus lean. Now, Golden is, you know, is near Denver, and in the wintertime you don't grow anything, the ground is frozen. So that water would then be discharged to an aquifer or to a, a stream that would eventually find its way to the South Platte, I guess. Um, but you wouldn't want to have your nutrients there. In the summertime, when you use it for irrigation, you would want to leave the nutrients in. So that's, uh, this is an example of uh, a system that's being evaluated. And um, again, referring to a conversation earlier, um, we need to show things at scale like this, that uh, in this case, um, treating the water from a dormitory complex and the facility would be about half the size of this room. And you know, people can tour it and say, oh yeah, this seems to be working, it's well instrumented, I understand something about the reliability of that. Um, so um, for the chemists in the crowd, uh, we, if, we, if, we, if we look at wastewater, it, uh, it contains uh, a lot of organic matter it's reduced organic matter. I mean, just think of it as like sugar or something like that, or carbohydrates. Also, it has ammonia in it. Um, all, all together, um, this chemical potential energy is two kilowatt hours per cubic meter. Uh, forget the units here, just think two. Um, now, currently, the way we treat that water is, despite the fact it has two units of potential chemical energy, we invest um, energy into the system, and the whole process ends up about minus 0.6 or 0.7. So a way for the future is to think about different kinds of systems. And, one, and the reason that those systems are so energy intensive is they rely on aeration. So if you go to a complete anaerobic process, you could um, uh, capture this organic matter as methane, uh, burn the methane to make electricity, you can capture the ammonia, uh, and we're investigating ways in which we can convert the ammonia to nitrous oxide. That could be blended in with the uh, uh, methane and gives you a, an additional boost on your energy there. So this is something that would be new, and this is what we would be testing at the, when I showed Stanford. Uh, this is what we want to demonstrate at the Stanford campus, and we put a test bed in at Stanford campus. It'd be a initial test bed would be about maybe 10 or 20 gallons a minute. And for those of you that know the Stanford campus, it'd be over kind of behind the fire station, if you know where that is. It's sort of where the corporation yard is. Also, it's where all the sewers on campus converge before they go off to Palo Alto. Um, but one thing I wanted to point at here was um, what's going on at East Bay Mud, East Bay Municipal Utility District. Now, they have a big wastewater treatment plant and it's, whoops, big wastewater treatment plant. And it's just located at the um, eastern side of the Bay Bridge. So if you're driving to Berkeley, um, when you, just as you get off the Bay Bridge, if you look to your right, you see their big treatment plant. And the things, the features you see are these big anaerobic digesters here. Now this plant um, was designed at a time, like San Jose, when there was a lot of canning taking place. You remember, um, maybe, well, I do, there was uh, still a lot of canneries in San Jose and in Oakland um, in the late 50s and early 60s. They're all gone now. What, what East Bay Mud has is excess capacity in uh, these digesters, which are designed to process the sludge, and you get some methane with that. But what they have done is uh, put in a program where they take um, waste from the Central Valley and from the wine country, bring it down to Oakland, and then um, put that material, after grinding it up, putting it into their anaerobic digesters and making methane, combusting that methane, 
and generating electricity. The end result of all of this now is that this treatment plant is the first one in the U.S. that's truly energy positive, and that's because of bringing in this trucked waste from different places. Uh, and, you know, they're fortunate, too, by, by where they're located, by the port. Also, um, they don't have any competition right now. So, you know, an interesting thing to look at is what's the business model for this for other cities? Um, and, you know, how many of these could you have around the bay and, and that sort of thing? But so why do I point to this? It's because an example of, um, of energy recovery, here uh, modifying a current plant, and at Stanford we're going to do something completely different with, with a whole new plant that would be 100% anaerobic. But you can look at, again at this as sort of for inspiration. Um, when we think in terms of broadening our treatment options, and that was one of those other boxes I showed, um, we um, would like to think more about natural systems and how can we um, use natural systems here like wetlands or here these infiltration systems along roadways, how can they become uh, a better part or an important part of our urban water infrastructure? Um, and we think these systems could play a big role in uh, uh, water reuse and stormwater capture and groundwater recharge. Um, so uh, this is the MIT club. So most of you are probably have a technical background, and I'd say that those with a technical background have a different view about natural systems than the general public. Um, the public looks at wetlands like this, and they think wildlife habitat, natural purification, low energy, it's green. Engineers look at them and say, well, you know, they're kind of unpredictable. Um, they seem to be inefficient. There's seasonal variability. We really don't know how to design them. As, as a chemical engineer undergrad, and we know how to design you know, processes, a unit operations approach. We design wetlands by uh, essentially what's worked in another place or rules of thumb. Uh, so th the engineers and the public have different views here. So we want to change that in our center. We want to learn about how to make these natural systems um, uh, more uh, desirable and predictable and important part of our urban water infrastructure. So to illustrate that, I'm going to show just a second pie chart of um, water supply. And this is a pie chart for the city of Los Angeles. Um, this is where we are today. Uh, the important thing to note here is this is not very much of a pie chart. There's one great big piece here. That's the Metropolitan Water District. That's water that comes from the Colorado and from Northern California. Uh, there's the LA Aqueduct, and there's some local groundwater. Here's how things are going to look in about 20 years. Um, even though there's a population increase in that area, the amount of imported water is going to go down. Um, LA has decided, uh, rightfully so, that they think their, their amount of water that will be available for them in the future is going to be less. They want to be less dependent on imported water, particularly from Northern California. And so how are you going to make up that difference? Um, one is that... Uh, Recycled water is going to grow a lot uh, from 1% to 8%. You know, recycled water like the purple pipe stuff. But these would be more through decentralized systems, not through the centralized ones. They're along the coast, and um, you'd, these would be done in a decentralized way. But something I wanted to point to here was stormwater capture. Now, for cities al along the California coast, our approach to managing stormwater has been to collect it up, uh, put it in a concrete channel and get it to the ocean as fast as we could. And, you know, the poster child for all of this are these systems down in L.A. Uh, my wife knows I like, you know, action movies. Uh, and, and we've all seen these things, right? Uh, this, is, this is the L.A. River. Uh, where I forget what movie that's from, but you can all use your imagination. Um, well, what, what, what happens is this. Um, we live in a Mediterranean climate. We have these big, flashy rainfall events. Um, all that water is gathered up quickly, put into the LA River or other such aqueducts, and it's just pushed off to the ocean. And we're losing a resource there. A secondary effect from all of this is that we end up with beach pollution. Um, and there's an opportunity then for us, as we think about systems for the future, is to um, capture storm water treat it, make it part of our water supply so we can actually get by with less imported water 
and we solve this problem of the, of the uh, polluted beaches. And this is a this is a um, project that we're working on with the uh, LA Department of Water and Power, uh, Department of Public Works, and the Bureau of Sanitation. And where we're working is an area called um, Sun Valley. It, it sounds really nice. It's the name does, uh, but it's sort of an industrial neighborhood a couple of miles north of the Burbank Airport. Uh, it doesn't show up very well on this on this slide, but uh, what there is here is an old quarry. It's a it's a 50 acre pit, uh, great big urban blight, and the plan is is to take this 50 acre site. The city's bought it and convert it now to a stormwater capture system uh, and a wetland treatment system. Here you follow the red line, and then pump it over here to some um, infiltration galleries. It's, um, this is about the right scale. Um, a little adjacent area in the Tahunga Wash uh, where you could recharge the groundwater. Um, so this is the, this is the situation today. This is the future. You know, you can see park, trail, tennis court, tot lot, basketball court. Say, gee, this is great. Um, yes, it is. Um, but there's a question here about <coughs> is what's not shown here is just north of this area. All these industrial. Um, um, facilities and salvage yards and the like. So the stormwater that comes down through this area is pretty dirty. So the challenge is, how do we design this system reliably so that through photolysis that might happen here, through um, microbial processes here, and through additional treatment systems that we'd build here using geomedia, that then we could say that when we put that water into the ground, it's really clean and we're not creating a groundwater contamination problem. So here's our team. Um, this, again, it's, the slide's a little dark, but that's, uh, um, uh, that's me. There's Ali Bain, uh, professor at Stanford, David Sedlak, professor at Berkeley, uh, and uh, graduate students and postdocs, and uh, Dave Pettyjohn, who's assistant general manager for water at, uh, at LA, uh, Department of Water and Power. And we're out there at the site, and we want to make this vision become a reality and our contribution there will be looking at how to clean up stormwater. And so stormwater um, has a bunch of different chemicals in it. You might think oils are the main ones, but in an urban area you have um, urban use uh, biocides and vehicle related compounds, including some things like this that you would find in uh, an uh, anti-corrosive agents, um, for example, or uh, additives to tires and things like that. And the urban her use herbicide. So those are the ones that we need to, to remove. And we're thinking that we can remove them in part by wetlands, where we take example of uh, utilized photochemistry, and then um, take um, water that's been uh, processed through a wetland, and then go through some kind of sandwich system here like that, that has different kinds of media, uh, engineered geomedia, uh, to take out the final, final contaminants. And uh, that's what we'll be studying down in Los Angeles is the idea of this um, geomedia. We'll set up a trailer there at that, at that site we were standing at to, to evaluate these concepts. Um, one of the things that's interesting here is I showed you a picture of a wetland with all these plants. Uh, another view of a wetland is, a, is an open cell system that's not very deep, maybe just a foot and a half. And you would use this system uh, for sunlight uh, degradation of compounds, photolysis. Uh, and then you would get a little bit of diatoms and bacteria down here. And you get a combination of uh, sunlight degradation and a little bit of microbial biotransformation there. And we studied this at a smaller system out at Discovery Bay. But um, Orange County has really um, uh, s helped us scale up. Again, I sorry, apologize for the dark picture. but. Um, this is the, a picture of the Prado wetlands, which treat half the flow of the Santa Ana River. And what's, what's just been finished um, in construction there for us for, um, for testing are three cells, um, each cell 100 feet wide and 800 feet long. So this is a, essentially a full-scale system in which we'll evaluate these uh, combination of, um, of uh, photochemical and these periphyton processes to help improve the water quality. And the, and the Santa Ana River, um, you know, during this time of the year is, is essentially 
um, treated wastewater from Ontario and San Bernardino and the like. Um, so I just wanted to sum up with the last couple slides here about how, how, do, how do these ideas really get into place? And that you, you need to address the public policy issues and you have to embrace urban planning. You have to ha understand um, uh, public attitudes. Um, need to be aware of regulatory issues and regulatory barriers to change. And those are all things that have to be addressed. And if we could have all the best ideas on those technologies I described, but if we didn't have buy-in from um, the local agency, and, and local agencies, you know, these are water boards. Water boards are either elected or appointed, but they represent the community, just like you all. So we could be having a meeting right now and saying, let's talk about water reuse in Palo Alto. And I could ask, what you're, what, how do you feel? You know, And uh, that would be like that kind of meeting right there about getting information about the community's planning and acceptance. And, and, and I just can't emphasize how important this is. And one way to visualize how important these communities are was go back and look at the pie chart for Los Angeles. Yeah, you probably don't remember that now. There were a whole lot of pieces around there. Remember that pie chart for the future? All of those, all those pieces. There's one piece there that you might think of. So there's something missing on that pie chart. There's no desalination. You know, Los Angeles is right there next to the ocean. But when you look at that pie chart, desalination was not part of the future strategy. Why is that? That's because the public has you know, expressed themselves and said that we think that desalination for us is not sustainable, takes energy, contributes to greenhouse gas emissions, um, and it produces a brine that could be problematic for disposal you know, along the coast. So for all those reasons, and the fact they had other choices to make, they said, we're not going to do that. Now, in the case of Carmel, um, they don't have quite all those choices, you know, so they're, they're looking at desal as part of it. But it's interesting when you look at, at, um, at Los Angeles and hear uh, about what, what they decided they'd like to do. And here, um, Sonoma County Water Agency is another uh, partner in our center. And what we're looking at here are um, ways to capture storm water uh, for, for um, reuse uh, as part of the drinking water supply. So the public has expressed themselves to the water agency and said, we have two concerns for the future. One, prevent flooding. Two, capture storm water for reuse. And so you know, understanding that process and then how, how it comes about and what the role for us is in terms of making those uh, wishes come true, well, that's, that's what our job is. Um, and then um, an interesting idea here and one that uh, we'll be working on shortly is this idea about um, the edge of the bay down here where we have all the salt ponds and the like. Um, could we do something different with the edge of the bay that, pr that could provide habitat, that uh, could provide some protection against uh, uh, sea level rise, and also would remove nitrogen. And nitrogen is something that's looming um, before all these um, uh, wastewater discharges is something they might have to address and they haven't had to in the past. And one idea here is imagine a um, sort of a, a linear wetland here. Uh, you, you take the, the wastewater from the treatment plant, run into this uh, dike system and let the water percolate uh, through the ground and the vegetation here will remove the nitrogen by this denitrification process. You create habitat here and you, um, you, you make this transition zone from fresh water to salt water. It's called the ecotone. And that has uh, largely disappeared from our bay because of fill. So this system then would um, be an example of a subsurface uh, wetland system that would do nutrient removal with the dike here. It would give us some climate adaptation, uh, maybe for 50 or 60 years, perhaps. Then later, we might have to build that more creates habitat and improves the urban aesthetic, you know, with hiking trails and that kind of thing. And so um, the, the system will be tested at uh, Oral Loma um, that applied for a grant in which we're participants uh, to look at the um, trial of one of these uh, uh, smaller systems here to see how, the, how this actually works. 
So this, I guess I'm just about done, is that when we look to the future here, we have to be able to demonstrate things at some scale, or otherwise it, it just won't be embraced. Um, it'll be viewed as quirky, or there's, as I was saying earlier to some folks, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of time a disincentive for taking on a risk. You know, in Silicon Valley, they say, what do they say? Fail early and often. You know, you fail once in our field and you're fired or you go to jail, you know, for real. Um, so this is, this is the way that I, like, let's say we were going to decide on how we might manage nitrogen for the bay. And here you are at the citizens meeting here. And, uh, and we, have our, we have some options here. We can optimize our plant, tweak it as best as we can. We could invest in some upgrades in the plants. We could think about wetlands of the kind I just showed. We could imagine more water reuse. If we did a whole lot of water reuse, then we're not putting nitrogen in the bay. Then we might really go to something extreme like source control, like think about collecting urine or something like that. And we could evaluate all these things you know, in terms of cost, the risk of failure, the institutional barriers. These are maybe the sort of common things you look at. But then the ancillary benefits, um, like uh, habitat, uh, recreation, and that sort of thing. The other funding that might come uh, to help support the project and the public support. And so it's how do you actually rank these things? Well, you know, I think at the end of the day, frankly, it comes down to something that looks a lot like this. Um, you, you can't just, you're not just adding up these things. You're stepping back and saying, what's the best option for us? So for us at our research center, um, we were, as I mentioned, we're interested in these wetlands and we're interested in water reuse. So our job then is to um, think about those squares that are yellow and orange and how do we make them green. And if, uh, if those horizontal rows were green, I think you would all say, yeah, I'm for that. that. That seems to work for everybody. And so that's one way of thinking about, you know, what's the role of university research. So what's the future then of our urban water? Um, more uh, locally sourced water, uh, decentralized systems, uh, the storm water uh, becoming part of our water supply, um, wastewater treatment with resource recovery, so that uh, you know wastewater is viewed not as a problem but as an opportunity. Um, a lot of um, potable reuse. It could be indirect, but probably someday we'll be evolving towards more direct potable reuse this integration of the natural and engineered systems, and bringing in our field more urban planning and social science and systems view. And so uh, that's all I wanted to talk about tonight. And you've been a very attentive audience. And I guess from now we're ready for some questions. Thank you. So um, in uh, Los Angeles, there's been a lot of conservation. And the conservation is predicted to increase, but maybe only about a percent of, or so a year. It's not, if they've done a lot, and they can do a little bit more. So that's part of their pie chart. Why isn't on the Santa Clara one, I actually, I should, probably should flip all the way back and see if it really is. Uh, but um, this is the first question that comes up, is, is conservation. And that's exactly right. Um, you know, but there are there are some heroes here in terms of uh, conservation, and, and uh, Monterey's done a lot, you know, and they're just basically at the place where they say we can't do more. Yet there's been a lot of conservation down in uh, Los Angeles, um, where um, different utility districts will will actually buy your front yard. They'll pay you something like I think Long Beach is up to three dollars a square foot. Now there's a cap on this, of course, you know, but they'll pay you to take out your lawn and put in. Uh, um, uh, escape or something like that. And we don't, uh, you know, we haven't gone quite that far here, but they've taken that, that I think, farther in Los Angeles in that area than uh, we have here. But that's, 
this is the yeah the most important thing is first conservation and uh, and there's a lot we can do but by the time we, we put in low flow toilets we go to drip irrigation we take out front yards maybe uh, we have our front loading washing machines and the like and then and, and we get down to a per capita use of water that's uh, maybe less than 50 gallons a day then you say well how much further can I go well now it really starts to, to hurt and or pinch and and so that's gets much more difficult it affects our lifestyle I mean I think a lot of us maybe have water saving devices in our showers but we all like to take showers you know um, and uh, so we can do a lot of things that in our lifestyles that change things but haven't changed our lifestyle radically I guess um, low flow toilets you know these are things that we can all put in and Santa Clara Valley Water District will pay to replace those um, building codes you know require those now and the like um, locally um, you know we will talk about maybe uh, gray water use how we could take our shower water and the washing machine water and reuse it um, a lot of I think that, that public is very much interested in that there's concerns about public health issues and that sort of thing but it can be done and if we got into a real drought uh, I'd do it you know my house is plumb that I could do it I don't do it right now but you know I have a few trees and some you know I like my trees <laughs> wouldn't want them to die so I would I would say well I'll capture that gray water and use it I, I don't know if I, I this way so conservation is still part of LA's plan but you have to realize where they're starting from they're starting from a good spot of having done a lot Increases, or is that just unrealistic? Well, um, uh, the thing uh, I'm going to repeat the question. The question is about uh, uh, prices and that uh, uh, will there be uh, big jumps in prices in the future? All of us are experiencing, when I say us, if you live uh, in Los Altos and North, our water bills are going up a lot, and that's because we're all paying for upgrades to the Hetch Hetchy system. Um, and that uh, seismic upgrade is something like a four and a half billion dollar bill. So our our cost of water, which used to grow up just a little bit, are now going up quite a bit more. But utilities are uh, the pricing is set by by boards and authorities, by elected officials. And you know, if I said your water bill is going to go 150 percent, you might think, oh my gosh. And for some reason, maybe in your mind, you're thinking that's like your electric bill. I think for most people, they probably don't know what their water bill is. It's too small. So the, the story is simply that water is underpriced for its value. It's underpriced. And that when we do new things in the future, like go to water reuse and the like, that water gets more expensive because it's not subsidized. The old systems were all subsidized, so much so by, by federal government. And, and things are quirky. Anaheim has really low-priced water. Why? Well, I mean, they have water distributed. Well, they just happen to be a place that has a sports team, and they have big amusement parks, and they have a whole lot of hotels. And so they get a whole lot, you know, they, they tax that, and that goes into the city coffers. But if you look at Santa Monica, their water costs about two to three times Anaheim's. And, and it's, it's a step function. The more you use, the more you pay. Anaheim doesn't have that. And so, I mean, uh, but they both get their water from the same place, from the Metropolitan Water District. And so this is a, you know, an economist looks at this and says, this is screwy. But it's the way it is. So I guess I, the answer is that um, there needs to be public education and about explaining the, the problem that we have and why we've done the conservation. We've done a lot on that and that we can do a bit more, but it's not going to, it's not going to fix our problem. So... Oh, we have some questions over here. Yeah. Um, when we're um, 
um, we live in a Mediterranean climate, so when we capture rainwater here, we're talking about storm water in the urban area. And what's happened in, um, in the urban area, it's so changed that you have hardscape. And so uh, the rainwater that we would be capturing here is, is basically runoff from streets and parking lots and that kind of thing. Um, so we're not, uh, uh, we're not taken away from a habitat. Rather, we are, if, if we use that water, rather than run it to the ocean, then that means we can get by with less imported water. And the place where the habitat concerns come in to be are like on the um, uh, Tuolumne River, for example, and leaving more water in the river or in, and in the San Joaquin River. So our water efficiency here would have environmental benefits over there. It's, um, it's a little more like that. Uh, the other thing about our locations for the cities and uh, big cities in California, we're all along the coast. So there isn't um, someone else that has a water right between us and the coast. It just, it just goes to the ocean. And but there is a question over here. Yeah. So there are a couple of comments there. Um, I would repeat, uh, there was a comment about the pricing and about uh, your experience that so many places have a flat rate that just says you owe so much a month, doesn't matter how much you use. Um, that's true you know, in some places. Um, but there's two parts to this, and that's that um, a, a utility has a whole lot of fixed costs. So even if you use a teeny bit of water, you have to have some kind of base. Um, then you need to have a tiered, some kind of pricing that says that's based on the amount of water that you use. Now, here's what's ironic. Uh, if we go to a lot of conservation, then that means, and, it, and that, means that there's going to be less income coming to the utility because their finances are based on the amount of water they sell. Well, if I use less water, and all of us do, they end up saying, we're going to have to raise your rates. And you say, well, how can that be? I'm saving water. Well, it's because we really we don't have the right pricing mechanism for that. Uh, so that was the one question. The other one is about, um, about the decentralized systems. And yes, when you have a new community, you can do a whole lot. Um, but so much is situational dependent. And I used the example there in Monterey. And there, there needs to be a little bit of plumbing there to go from the Carmel River over, over into the seaside. So you, there's some new plumbing that's required, an extension of things. But you can step back and you take a little bit of a regional approach there, and you can come up with some great ideas. But that's, that requires cities work together. The other example um, is Stanford. Uh, and what's quirky about Stanford um, in terms of water is that inside the campus drive loop, that's where all the academic part of the campus is. Inside the campus drive loop, there's two water distribution systems. There's the Hetch Hetchy system, and there's an irrigation system that uses water from Felt Lake. So the idea then for us is that we could do this water reclamation and put that water into that irrigation system on campus, which does rely on Hetch Hetchy water at certain times, and save our Hetch Hetchy water. So it's just this is, I mean, why did John Echemendi's the provost, all right? And, and we're asking him to help finance this. And he signed a check for $2 million. Why, why does he want to do this? It's because I say, 
John, you know, in the future, your ability to put more housing on campus or, your, or a new research building, it, not, it may not be because you can't find some Silicon Valley gazillionaire. <laughs> it might be because you can't get a permit. And, you, and, it, and the permit means you've got to show where your water is going to come from. And we're already at our limit of near, if we get into a drought, we are right now today at the limit of what we can take from the Hetch Hetchy system. So this recycled water system then would meet the campus needs as, as far as we can see in the future would be the end of the century. So, uh, but that's because we, we can see one immediate use. It doesn't have to go into our potable supply. I mean, my gosh, we got that Hetch Hetchy water for that. But we can use it for cooling and we can use it for irrigation on campus. And where I live on campus, there used to be a separate irrigation system too, but they took that out some years ago. There's a way, then we'll come up here, yeah. Well, this is so. The question was that um, these two ladies um, work in an industry uh, that's related to uh, groundwater cleanup and remediation. And you're exactly right. Um, if we put water into the ground, we want to make sure it's clean. Now, um, the San Fernando Valley um, has a lot of uh, groundwater contamination problems, a lot with chlorinated solvents and, per and perchlorate. And another part of their pie chart for LA Basin was to treat that contaminated groundwater and make it become part of their water supply. So what they've done in the past is they kind of abandoned that, those, that contaminated water and now they're constructing some of the biggest systems ever to remove those, uh, those uh, contaminants. So when I went down and my deputy director, Dave Sedlak, go down and we talked to the LA Department of Water and Power and we talk about stormwater capture, the first thing that comes to the mind of the general manager for the water district, my gosh, is we don't want to create another groundwater pro contamination problem because we already have a, such a huge problem and we want to make sure the water's clean. And that's where we can come in. Um, and so um, you, you're, you're quite correct in saying what well, you want to be aware of, uh, of the prospect for future regulations to impact um, your, your water quality standards, um, but I'm, I'm confident that we can do that and that with our current analytical techniques, um, we can detect more and more compounds to ever low concentrations. Um, and we will probably end up finding groups of compounds that are uh, representative of certain classes of chemicals that if we can show that I tracks say maybe, I don't know, let's say like two dozen compounds of different kinds, that means, okay, I'm, I've gotten rid of my beta blockers, I've gotten rid of my ibuprofens, I've gotten rid of my x-ray contrast agents, I've gotten rid of whatever else you might find of trace amounts. But it's a real problem. Um, but again, when we put water into the ground and we take it out, we don't just open up a spigot, it goes through a water treatment plant. So um, there's that. And let's take, well, well, we'll do you, then we'll do the lady back here. Yeah? Oh, um, I'm not sure I understand the question either, but let's take this pit in L.A. Uh, 
which is basically a, an abandoned quarry, and a lot of stuff has been dumped there. There will be a lot of excavation to make this a, a deep hole, some 50 feet. Then it's all going to get lined so that no water will percolate into the ground from the pit itself. Everything gets treated because they don't know what all was disposed there and what might be right underneath that pit. So they put a liner there so that all that water that comes in and goes through that system is not infiltrating at that spot. It goes through all the treatment processes, and we put on these polishing treatments, and then it gets pumped into this other system a block or two away. So I don't know if the question was, uh, the one, you got to be careful about what you put in the ground so you don't contaminate it, and the other one is you also have to be careful about what the ground looks like. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what, the, what the ground looks like? Well, okay, that's fine. We, there's some other hands. Well, you had a question, didn't you? Okay, we'll do you then him. Um, how well, how can I disagree with the public? <laughs> yeah. uh, the uh, who is the public in this case? Well, there's some very powerful organizations. As someone once told me once, you know, you never want to go against uh, the Audubon Society. You know, you want the Audubon <laughs> Society on your side. You know, that's why wetlands are popular, for example. But in L.A., um, they're the Surf Riders, a very po a very powerful citizens group, and it was the uh, Surf Riders that were thinking about you know the brine along the coast. Then there's another organization that's very much into um, uh, the issues about energy and, and being green, and that's tree people. Uh, it's a funny name, but they're very powerful. As, and so, you, you, you know, when we have a public meeting like this, let's say I'm the water department guy in L.A., and then you all come here. Half of you are tree people. The other half are surf riders. Whoa, I'm going to listen to you all. A lot, and that's that's just the way it is. So um, local groups can be very influential, and again, the um, uh, none of these utilities uh, are. Uh, they may seem like fiefdoms, but they're responsible to a board, and the board is either elected or appointed by the mayor, so, uh, appointed by the mayor, say, or elected by the public, and 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 they're responsive, and you know they want to retain their job. So it's just, I mean, it's very interesting. This is a good social science, political science question. You know, why did LA make the choices it did? And, uh, and why did San Diego not? San Diego's building the largest desalination facility in the Western Hemisphere, you know, in Carlsbad. And San Diego's not. I mean, LA's not. And say, so you got, well, what's going on between those two places? I'm not going to try to answer that, but that's. But there's a really, you know, it's one is a, one is are you on the short end of the stick, and the other one is do you have other options, um, and the like. So, but those are that's the kind of thing where I said, uh, the you know the social science plays such a big role here. It's about, you know, ten years ago I wouldn't have made this list, um, and yet you you read this list now and you say, oh, but good. Let's do that, you know. Um, but this is, you know, this comes across by, you know, kind of realization, kind of where we are, where, what our opportunities are today. Again, that we're at the end of our design life of our systems. We have the some, we we can do something new and different. We'll have to pay for it, of course, but we can be wiser with our use of resources. And maybe this will be the last question, and then we'll have to call it. not use the waste water directly in the political system. And I, my question is, you know, why, and who makes that call, and uh, is it possible that call will be changed, and if it is changed, what will lead to that change? Um, so the question has to do with uh, taking wastewater, treating it very highly, and then putting it directly into our public water supply. Now, 
that means it would still go through the water treatment plant. It would just go into a reservoir that then goes into our um, public water supply. In the case of um, Orange County Water District, they they inject uh, this water, this highly treated wastewater, the same thing that they do here in uh, uh, Silicon Valley that I showed. They put it into the ground. It stays in the ground about six months and comes out, and they use it as part of their drinking water. Um, and that experience came through lots of years of research and lots of public education. And it also happens in Orange County that um, there's a good aquifer to do that. And also, the aquifer underlies the whole county. So, you know, everyone's part of the problem and everyone's part of the solution in that case. Um, in terms of direct potable reuse, um, it's happening in, um, you can go and Google this, uh, Big Springs, Texas, and in Cloudcroft, New Mexico, um, where these are by intentional design. Uh, these are very water stress region, uh, regions. Big Springs, Texas is in West Texas, very water short. Um, and we're going to see more of this. In the case of Santa Clara Valley, what I see happening is this 10 million gallon a day system will grow to 40. And you say, well, why don't I put that water into the ground or into the Anderson Reservoir or something like that? And then it stays in that those reservoirs for you know some months or a year, and then it comes out again and we use it, and that's probably what will happen in the in the future. So that would be a, a bit indirect. Uh, we're not quite at the place where we'll do direct, though there are two cities that are doing it now, and there's a couple more that I've heard about as well. Um, the Current law in California, um, as I understand it, requires a six month travel time in the subsurface. And that was because there is this belief that each month in the subsurface resulted in one log removal of viruses. And where that number came from is, is, is lost in time. But um, that's uh, sort of where we are. Oh, yeah, there's a whole um, movement underway to think, why should I put that water in the ground? Why don't I put it in a big tank, you know, an engineered system, hold it there? And so um, a group of utilities in California and in other states are studying this. Yeah, well, I, I, I kind of like the idea of a holding tank where you have some reservoir so that if there's a little upset, you know, you have time to react. It's that, but but the idea of having a um, not relying on six months in the ground, but one month in a big tank that you built, um, this will be. We'll, 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 I'm sure, with, you know, in a decade or so, we'll see that. And this is something that's moving ahead. It's on the minds of lots of utilities, and so that's what they would call a direct portable reuse, where it goes into a tank, from a tank then into the influent to the treatment plant. But you've all been very uh, cooperative audience. You had lots of great questions. But it is, um, um, I have an 8 o'clock class tomorrow. And one of my students <laughs> is sitting back there. <laughs> I'll have 58 eager students tomorrow <laughs> at 8 o'clock. <laughs> all right. Let's give a hand to our speaker, Professor Luthi. Thank you so much for, for coming and, and talking to us. And uh, oh, whoops. Before we close out the evening, I have a few more thanks to give.